and so they went to church from time to time. But a lot of things that they did, especially the Lord's Supper, praying together, fellowship, where, where did they do those kinds of things? Yeah, you know, we've got small groups that are going on right now, and that's what this basically was, a small group. And each uh, small group could uh, get together and they could pray about different things and uh, pick uh, something that they wanted to work towards. They could go out and do missionary work or they could uh, help somebody who was in need, whatever it might be, so that they could uh, spread the gospel news even more. So it was in an instance like this where Peter and John, who evidently were a team, you know, Christ sent them out first, two by two, and uh, they were going up to the temple. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the service was supposed to start. And uh, there's a place there that uh, was devoted to teaching. It was called a court, and the court had roofs that uh, went out around it, and the different rabbis, or teacher, as we might call them, would come and they would get their little groups together and they would start teaching under these roofs. It was here that uh, Peter and John saw this fellow who was uh, crippled and uh, needed some help. Uh, he was holding out his hand for maybe a slice of bread or a coin. And uh, Peter says, you know, we don't have anything that we can give you. But such as we have in the name of Jesus Christ, I say, get up and walk. And this guy does so. So there are people in the in the Jewish church, who were the leaders, and they didn't like what was going on, especially this name of Jesus, saying that Jesus had been crucified and now he was alive, and now he was doing all these things through the Holy Spirit. So they were rather upset with these two. were upset about using the name of Jesus in relationship to the resurrection, the Sadducees, because they didn't believe in the resurrection anyway? Yeah. Um, they were the Sadducees, and they didn't believe in the resurrection, and this was an affront to, to them for what uh, the uh, apostles were saying to the people. Now, we remember the high priest, when Christ died, was a Sadducee. And most uh, people who were high priests were Sadducees. There was another group called the Pharisees who believed in the resurrection, and uh, they didn't find anything wrong with that. Remember when uh, Paul was first taken prisoner, he was telling uh, people, well, I'm a Pharisee. And when he said Pharisees, there's a vision between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So it was something that was quite remarkable. But there was a, another group of people called the Sanhedrin. There was a council. What, what do you think the Sanhedrin was all about? Huh? Well, it did have power, but it was something that was basically set up after the things that Moses did. Uh, in Jerusalem itself, there were 71 members to this council, and in other cities throughout, there were 23 members that made up a council. It was basically a court, and they made decisions between what needed to be done. Now. The Jewish people could not actually use their own laws, except in certain instances. They had to go by the law of, of Rome. But when it came to those jurisdictions that they had power over, then they could uh, uh, 
uh, take precedent over what was going on. But the thing about it is that these apostles were put into a place where they had to decide what needed to be done and then they carried it through. Now there are what they call five main points. This is on page 24 in your lesson study. Five main points characterize early Christian preaching. First point, first point was that Jesus was the suffering Messiah. And we know he came, he lived an exemplary life. He died, not for his sins, but for our sins. And he took upon himself the sins of everyone who had ever lived. Now, he died on that cross, and in the process, God resurrected him to life. But his gift was not accepted here. He had to go to heaven to have his gift accepted. And there in heaven, he was exalted. And once the exaltation took place, then the Holy Spirit could come into the apostles, or into the 120 people, for that matter. So we've got uh, a God who, who has lived, he has died, been our example, and in the process he's been exalted in heaven. Now one of his promises is, I will come again. And so we're waiting yet for Christ to come, but he will come, and there's no doubt that he will come. Now on Friday's lesson, Page 28, I wanted to read this to you because uh, we all keep saying, well, Christ can come tomorrow. But this comment, number two, under discussion says, we should be ready as if Jesus would come today, but continue working in the mission of the church as if he would take another hundred years to come. You know, the apostles got this time thing wrong, but he, Christ had told them, nobody knows the time nor the hour, only the Father that's in heaven. And for some reason, they got it wrong. But there's another thing that we need if we're going to uh, live with Christ, and we have to repent of all of our sins. And it says he's gracious. He's willing to forgive all of our sins and blot them out. <coughs> now, the, the situation today is different, isn't it? But these same principles still apply today. Nothing's really changed. Um, there's a remark made that we think there's a big difference between what they were going to church for in a Jewish church and what uh, the early church taught. The early church was teaching that which was a fulfillment of what the Old Covenant was all about. So the beliefs ran in a, in a one strain or one stream, if you will, and there was no difference. In, in that respect. So they were basically teaching the same things. When we uplift Christ, we uplift these same things that the apostles were talking about. Even in the context of the three angels' message of Revelation 14, Jesus crucified, Jesus Christ risen, Jesus Christ returning, must be the center of how we proclaim these messages. So, you know, it's not like uh, God decided he wanted some deep secrets to give to people. He started off with one concept, and he carried that concept through, throughout. And now we're waiting for that second coming of Christ. Also on that uh, Monday's page 24, it says... 
The Sabbath should be included in this truth, but that's what the Jews were teaching. The great center of the attraction is Christ Jesus, and he must not be left out of anything. At the cross of Christ, mercy and truth meet together, and righteousness and peace kiss each other. So everything is summed up in what Christ did for us upon the cross and what he is going to do for us when he comes again. And we talked a little bit about this opposition of these uh, different uh, people that made up the Sanhedrin. They were jealous. They saw that their power, and we talked about that briefly, they saw that their power was dissipating. And they wanted to continue that power. It was through the process that they had been living under for over 400 years between the Babylon captivity and, and Christ's coming that uh, they had gotten their power. They had written their little special laws. They had uh, made uh, the Jewish people or those who accepted Judaism uh, almost slaves to the things that were happening around them. Uh, you couldn't walk so far on the Sabbath day. You couldn't cook a meal. You couldn't turn on your electric electricity. Uh, just lots of laws that God did not implement for the people to have to be exposed to, but the things that uh, they had come up with, so they wanted to hold on those uh, very tightly. The challenge about authority posed by the Jewish leaders suggests a concern of power. Peter, however, declared not only that the miracle had been performed in the name of Jesus, but also salvation comes from him only. You know, it takes away all this good work stuff that, that the priest had been proclaiming. Uh, you can't go through a, a field of grain. And you can't pluck it on the Sabbath day because they had boiled all these things down to a, to a type of work. And work was not acceptable. It's one of the things they do. But Christ has told us that when you find somebody in hunger, uh, you feed them. Uh, when you find somebody in need, you take care of the need, whether it's changing the car tire, whether they're on the way to camp meeting or whatever. So... There are certain things that we have to look at and we have to concern, but we have to, what would Jesus do? One of those types of situations. Well, the Sanhedrin didn't know what to do with these people, uh, uh, Peter and John, and uh, they began to think some things. I find that was very beautiful in the early church was that once the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles and the believers, not only did they multiply in number, but they truly loved each other, and they were very cohesive. Um, I mean, that was the example, the extreme example of Ananias and Sapphira lying and dying because of their lying. But people were selling their property and sharing it with those that didn't have. I'm not saying that people would do that now, but it was the breaking of bread and going into each other's houses. And it was like they couldn't get enough of, of fasting and praying and studying the word. And, you know, I couldn't help but wonder, I wonder what would happen right now, 2018, if we did that, I mean, as a church, I wonder what would happen if we studied the word like the early church and prayed, would Jesus come in 2019? Do you belong to a small group? I beg your pardon? Do you belong to a small group? Yes, I do. That's a start. That's a start. When you go into the small groups, you have an opportunity to be an individual that can work in order to 
accomplish God's goal for the message to go to all the world. Um, you can't sit back in the pew. You got 413 people, I believe it is, that belong to this church. And you can't just sit back in the pew and let somebody else do the work. When you get into a small group, you get these different things that uh, you set as goals, and then you go out to do those goals. It might be going through your neighborhood, cleaning up somebody's yard that can't do it and can't afford to have it done. It might be painting their house to make it look better, uh, make them feel better in that respect. It might be taking a neighbor to uh, the grocery store or, or to the pharmacy to get their medications. So there's lots of things that we can do in a small group that we won't necessarily do in a large group. In a large group, I think we'd much rather give our money as to give our time. And when you, when you break down into small groups like they were, you know, this doesn't mean you had 2,000 people descending upon one person's house. It didn't work that way. And I think it's the book of Corinthians. Huh? They gave of themselves. I mean, it wasn't, you know, yeah, you could come here and you could give your money, but you're not giving of yourself. You know, because if you're rich, giving your money isn't anything. You know, if you have extra money to spare at home, giving your money is nothing. But giving of yourself is everything. But what a little lady with two mites. And when the big old guy coming in with his entourage, blowing the trumpets and everything. Yeah. Uh, which one had given the most? The woman with the two mites. But it's not just the two mites. It's giving of your talents. Okay. Giving of your time. Okay. You know, that's giving of yourself. Do you have time? Yes, I do. Okay. Remember that. Sure. Excuse me for being a critic, but um, I have all kinds of time and nobody ever uses mine. But anyway, um, I found that the rich people give less than the poor people. And Jesus pointed that out in that two mites thing. I mean, here's all these people with plenty of money and they're hardly giving anything, but this lady, who has nothing gives her last. And that that really touched Jesus. I mean it it really moved him. So are we just talking about money? We mentioned talents, we mentioned other things. Can we always give money? No. Uh, can we give service? Yes. There's lots of things we can do if, if we want to do. Now, it says that when they were in that upper room during that 10 days before Pentecost, what were they doing? What? They were praying. They were praying. Is that all they were doing? Studying God's Word. Studying God's Word. And it says and it and it says that they were of one accord. So do we sometimes in our church hear a lot of bickering? Somebody doesn't quite do as well as somebody else and maybe they ought to be replaced, uh, you know. I'm not going back to church anymore because so-and-so did so-and-so to so-and-so, and, -so and uh, I just don't think there's any Christians there. Is that what you heard in that upper room? No, you didn't hear that, did you? Because every one of them knew that none of them were perfect. And if they were wanting to measure up to the character of Christ, they would have to be like him. And when you look at the picture of Jesus Christ, you know you aren't him, you know. It's just not there. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, we each can become just like Christ if we 
submit ourselves to him and let his spirit guide us. Most of them are just like my grandson. Not going to do it. You can't make me. You know? And God shows you a, a smooth way. Might not be the easiest way, but it's a smooth way that he will take you through life and he will make you into his character the more you give him yourself. Um, that's one of God's greatest characters. It's he doesn't want to make you do anything. He wants you to do it on your own. I mean, God wants you to be saved because you want to be saved, for one thing. It's that God wants you to give, like it says, God loves a cheerful giver. He wants you to give because you want to give, not because he wants you to give. And you can't go in that mind. That's how I go. So basically we're talking about giving totally of oneself. Is that what we're talking about? And it takes a, a lot more. But look at Peter and look at John. Did they have anything to give this guy? They evidently didn't have any bread to give him. And they sure didn't have any coins to give him. But such as they had, in the name of Jesus, give us to you, stand up and walk. And through the Holy Spirit, they were able to have this gentleman do so. And we each are in this same type of boat. Because God wants to dwell within us. He wants to give his grace to us, which is basically the same as giving us his righteousness. He wants us to become more perfect through him. But, but the Sanhedrin, they're after Peter and John. They take them in again. And Peter says these words, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You know, we've been living a very easy life. What if tomorrow the Congress of the United States passed a law that says that we will not let anyone buy or sell unless they say what we tell them to do? Things are going to get rough. But when you listen to what Peter here says, you know, We've either got to obey you or we've got to obey men. And we prefer to obey God. And we'll speak and we'll do those things that he presents to us. Yeah, your rights can be taken away from you with the stroke of a pen. It's getting more simple-like, too, isn't it? The more you hear things every day on the news, before you just didn't think that could ever happen. But indeed, it, it will happen someday. Well, let's look at Ananias and Sapphira. Now, these were two wonderful people. They got caught up in uh, what was going on. Oh, by the way, utopia, utopia. The only time that utopia has ever worked in this world, actually, I'm saying this, when this world was part of heaven, utopia worked. You know, Paul even reached the point. He says, if you don't eat, you don't work. And when you're in utopia, they usually fall apart because not everybody wants to carry their own weight. And it takes everybody, give them as much as 100% to get the job done. And there are a lot of people out there that don't want to do this. They want to take the benefit, but they don't want to do the help. So... But Ananias and Sapphira, they had property, so they were probably doing all right. And uh, they got to looking at this. How many times, well, here in this church, we had an experience for years. Uh, we were trying to get monies together to build this church. 
And for years, we heard one sermon after the other for funds to build a church. Then they come back and uh, buy your house, and they ask for donations. They want, want you to sign an agreement. Now, I've never seen that happen, but I'm sure it does, you know, among other things. But I do know if you want to borrow some money or you want to buy a car or if you want to do anything, you've got to sign on the line. And it's real nice for the guy who's giving it to you to sign because usually if you're charging about 18 to 20 some odd percent interest on it. And, you know, it's take it or leave it. But God's not that way. He gives us a choice. You notice that in the early church, this is on Wednesday, page 26, pooling of goods in the early church was not compulsory. What does that mean? It's not compulsory. It was volunteer. It wasn't mandatory. It was voluntary. Sometimes uh, people will have pressure brought upon them by the people around them. Um, they know what their needs are. They know what they need to do. They know how much they can give. You know, if you're taking care of your money, you go through your budget with a fine-tooth comb and where can I cut here, where can I cut there? And uh, then you figure out what you can do towards this, towards that. God wants us to be faithful. I'm not too sure if I'm even given the right appropriate statement here. But you were talking about Ananias. What, what's, who in Ananias? Okay. Were you talking about them? Okay. Then maybe I'm just not. Anyway, it wasn't the fact that they didn't give. It was the fact that they lied about it. Well, uh, the last thing he talks about doing something impulsively. What, what do you do when you do something impulsively? Or you do it without thinking about it and then regret it later. There you go. You do it because you get caught up in the moment. They didn't have to make a commitment to give anything. They could have sold their land and kept all the money and it wouldn't have been a problem. But what they did is they said, well, we're going to sell our land and we're going to give whatever percent. And then after they sold their land, it was like, well, you know, we got this and I don't know if I want to give all of that. And, and so that's where the problem came in because when they when they uh, didn't give it that cost them their life and probably their soul now now why would it cost them their life they broke a vow God they made the vow in public wasn't a quiet thing that they made between them and God. They, but it was a public thing between the people and God. Like we're going to do this, and then when it came around, they really didn't do that. And then God revealed that, hey, they didn't do what they publicly said that they were going to do, and that was their mistake. In other words, they could have said, uh, "We've got so much money coming. We're going to keep fifty percent and give you." give the church 50%, and that would have been okay. But they hid the fact that they kept it back so much. But can anybody lie to God? I mean, can you really lie to God? I mean, and get away with it? Uh, you can lie to God, but you can't get away with it. Uh,
Israel lied all the time because every time he said something to them, all that you have said, we will do. And they never did it. Yes, they did. They did lie to God all the time. But well, I forget the... I, And plus, God was fulfilling his vow to Abraham and was very patient with Israel and probably gave Israel more chances than he might have because of the vow that he had made with the forefathers. But the abomination of desolation was when God said, I've had enough, cut, end of this. Okay, okay. I'm going to be their defense attorney here. It's, uh, when they said it, they meant it. And then they changed their mind. But I also saw what just reading in Luke today. If somebody sins against you seven times today, but each time they say, please forgive me, you forgive them. And that's the way it was with the Israelites. No matter how many times they messed up, when they were sincerely sorry, God forgave them. They hadn't been out of the Red Sea but just a few days before they were burnt, uh, making a golden calf at Mount Sinai. So all that we, all that you have said we will do didn't last very long. They had very short-term memory problems and they didn't keep the law that God told them to do. Okay. No. Uh those times up. Okay, but here's the thing. They took and made a deliberate attempt to cover up what they were doing. They essentially died, allied to the Holy Spirit because of what they did. An example had to be made. Now, if a guy goes out and picks up wood on the Sabbath day, uh, Moses is stopped. He doesn't know what to do with this person. And God says, take him out and stone him. Now, God at times delays the sentence that he has pronounced. And in that time, a person has an opportunity to ask forgiveness. Now, Jewish people made a plaything out of asking forgiveness. They never meant it. The only reason they served God in the first place was to get the benefits that he was willing to give. And as long as they obeyed him and did what he asked, he always did good for them. He went out before their army. He made sure there was food on the table from the growth and things of that nature. But these people didn't. They had committed a sin and God called it. And we see that Sapphira was able to ask forgiveness because Peter says, this is a sin. Uh, did such and such happen? And she could have said yes, but she said no instead. And as a consequence, he had a second chance. But we don't know about Ananias. Uh, the lesson says perhaps uh, it was cut short and we didn't get to see that part. But there was a, there was a second arrest of Peter and John. And uh, they stood up before the Sanhedrin again. And they uh, pled their case. And in it, uh, Peter says, we should obey God rather than man. He's gone from letting them make a choice to we have to obey God rather than man. But we're going to end the, the lesson with a gentleman that was at the Sanhedrin. And this guy was well known. It says that he was not a rabbi. He's a rabban. I hope I'm saying that correctly. A rabban is our teacher, whereas a rabbi is my teacher. He was a teacher of teachers. And when Paul talks about him being a Pharisee of Pharisees, 
This was his teacher. This was the one he was raised up under. And, uh, you know, the Sanhedrin was saying, well, this is a bunch of do-gooders out there, and they're doing things that we don't want them to do. Uh, so we're really going to punish them hard so they'll stop doing it. And Gamaliel says, look, there were two leaders that came up. They had lots of followers, and they did all kinds of bad things. But in the process of time, the leaders were killed, and all these followers dispersed, and we don't even hear them today. But I suggest to you that if this is not of God, it's going to fall apart. You don't have to worry about it. But if this is of God, then you are not fighting against man. You're not fighting against these two people, but you're fighting against God, and you can't win. So I suggest that you just leave it be and see which way it goes. Well, we know the end of the story, don't we? Because it's been 2,000 years, and even though we see some ebb and tides, going on in the Christian church. It's still here. It's still going strong. Jesus Christ is still the leader. And it's been a while, but I dare say he will come when his father says, Son, it's time to go get your children. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for these lessons. We pray that you'll keep being with us. Give our thoughts to you. Take our whole being and make it into what you want it to be. Lord, bless the Sabbath schools all over the world today as they hear this message. And grant each and every one of them your peace. Amen.